Welcome uh, to the Hamburg Institute for Social Research. Uh, uh, I'm glad you came. Um, this is a special night uh, for us. Uh, special, first of all, of course, because uh, Wolfram Kaiser is with us, and uh, that is a special occasion. Um, it is also a special night for us because uh, this is um, uh, the first time we are having a summer school uh, at the Hamburg Institute for Social uh, Research, and uh, tonight's talk is part um, of uh, that summer school, uh, to be explicit, it's the public talk um, that is taking part within the framework of uh, the summer school under the title Deconstructing Europe, Your Skepticism, Right-Wing Politics and the Crisis of European Democracy. Um, the summer school is uh, financed uh, in a cooperation of the Zeitstiftung um, uh, and the Hamburg Institute. Um, and well, we started today and plan to continue, continue through Friday. Uh, so there's still work ahead of us. And uh, also tonight, we won't stop. <laughs> uh, my name is Philip Mueller. Um, I'm working at the Hamburg um, Institute for Social Research. I'm a historian uh, and will sort of try and guide you uh, through the evening. Um, my first task is to present uh, Wolfram Kaiser, who is a professor of European Studies at the University of Portsmouth, and at the same time a visiting professor at the College of Europe. But actually his activities um, are not restricted to the academic world in the strict sense. Uh, they're much wider. For about a year now, um, Wolfgang Kaiser is also the head of the European Parliament History Service. And besides that, he has numerous functions uh, and numerous projects with institu uh, institutions that are dealing with Europe and uh, European European history. Among other things, uh, he's cooperating with the House of European Inter um, History in Brussels, um, and just many other things. Um, as you might imagine, uh, considering his range of activities uh, and his uh, academic and beyond academic uh, uh, duties, uh, he has uh, given talks, uh, published um, on numerous fields, and <laughs> they're way too numerous uh, to be mentioned here. I'm just focusing on, on his, uh, I guess, most important uh, books, actually, and there's much more than that. Some of his um, is uh, to be found outside on those yellow sheets. Um, uh, there's a book on that is uh, called, or the title of which is Using Europe, Abusing the Europeans, Britain and European Integration. But there's also another one he published in 2007 on uh, history and politics of Christian democ uh, democracy, to Christian democracy and the origins of European Union. Uh, one book that I think is especially important for the summer school, but might also be uh, uh, important for, for tonight, is uh, he wrote in, and published in 2014 with uh, Johan Schott, uh, Writing the Rules for Europe, Expert Cartels and International Organizations. Uh, it's a study in this book, um, um, the authors uh, focus on hidden and alternative forms um, of European integration that are actually much older than the European community that sort of paved the way um, to what then later on become, uh, became first uh, the uh, European uh, community, then the uh, European Union, but also created some sort of um, alternative paths that might be considered even uh, origins of uh, resistance and criticism to what then became uh, European integration. Most recently, um, he published a study on the European Parliament that traces the European, European Parliament's um, efforts uh, to institutional ref uh, reform of the European communities. Um, and uh, uh, in 2020, uh, another book on the group of uh, European People's Party and the European integration. So we had Wolfram Kaiser with us um, almost two years ago at a workshop um, that was dealing with the history of resistance uh, to European integration. And I just have to say, you truly impressed us <laughs> uh, with uh, your talk, but also with the advice you gave to everyone uh, present at that workshop, uh, which was really um, at the start from, uh, for many of those projects and a great help. Um, all of this, <laughs> what I've said so far about Wolfram Kaiser, um, in some sort of sense uh, started at the University of Hamburg in 19, uh, 
94, where you finished your PhD thesis. So, Wolfram, thank you very much for coming. Um, I don't know if we would have managed to do this without you. <laughs> uh, we are very much looking forward uh, to your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Philip Müller and everyone else from the Institute here for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here tonight and to share some ideas on European integration uh, with you in historical perspective. Uh, I have a long attachment to the city of Hamburg because as a child we usually went to Hamburg uh, once or twice a year because we had relatives here. And I guess I'm the only one as a result who is a fan in as much as I'm a fan of anything, of both the Hamburger SV and St. Pauli. This is, of course, completely impossible in Hamburg, but it's possible if you come from a small other Hanseatic city, Lemgo, which is where I was born and grew up. And then later on, towards the end of my MA studies, I actually came to Hamburg and also did my PhD here with a, a supervisor based at the University of Hamburg, although I actually spent most of my time at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland during that period. So that's one reason why I'm always happy to be back in Hamburg, but also for the same reason that you've already mentioned, which is that my first, uh, my first contact with your institute, although of course I knew a lot about it before, was two years ago in conjunction with the start of your project, as you've just pointed out, and I really enjoyed the working atmosphere at this institute, which of course is very highly interdisciplinary. My own position at my university is for European studies, so that's deliberately interdisciplinary on the borderline between contemporary history or history in a longer term perspective as well and the social sciences. I'm actually based in the Department of Politics and International Relations, not history. So this uh, form of interdisciplinarity that you're practicing here generally at the Institute and also in conjunction with the summer school I find extremely uh, fascinating and interesting. I'm really happy to be able to contribute to this in the context of the summer school, although unfortunately I can only stay until tomorrow lunchtime. Now, um, in Britain, we usually say that British academics begin a lecture with a joke and German academics with an excuse. And so you already know that I'm a German by nationality, so you have to expect an excuse, which is why, uh, you know, is it that I'm actually speaking as a German who is speaking in Hamburg? Why is it that I'm speaking in English? And I think you've already provided the explanation for that, which is because of the summer school. The summer school is uh, in, in, conducted in English, and as a result, there are also, of course, participants who don't understand uh, German, and hence this evening lecture is uh, also in uh, English. But that's not a problem problem in Hamburg because I learned when I came to the University of Hamburg, of course, that Hamburg is the gateway to the world. I don't know whether you're still using this phrase uh, nowadays uh, in advertisements for the city. I could never really find the gateway, but I think it was something in the imagination of the merchants of the Hanseatic city of Hamburg that this was a gateway to the world, but certainly a gateway to a form of uh, Anglophile attitudes and often pro-British uh, orientation that I have actually found profoundly disturbing myself. As I'm now living in post-Brexit Britain, <laughs> I find any form of Anglophile attitudes very disturbing. But um, today I'm going to talk about contesting European futures, jiu-jitsu, and I will try to explain this in a minute, of course, between Europhiles and Eurosceptics in the past. Uh, I hope that I'm not overdoing uh, this in the lecture in terms of opening up many different avenues without exploring, being able to explore them in any great detail, but we can see, of course, what you are interested in and hopefully we'll have an interesting uh, question and answer session after the lecture. Some of you, not the younger ones among you, but uh, others will probably recall that in 2012 the Norwegian Nobel Committee awarded its Peace Prize to the European Union for its contribution to, I quote, to the advancement of peace and reconciliation, democracy and human rights in Europe, unquote. For the European Union, the award had great symbolic value. After all, the decision had been taken by committee members from Norway, a state that has been semi-detached from European integration for a very long time. As a member of the European Economic Area, Norway is part of the European Union's internal market, but only has limited consultative political rights. Having been occupied by Nazi Germany during the Second World War and bordering in the north on a once more imperialist Russia, 
Norwegians nevertheless have a very acute sense of the need for organized cooperation in Europe that goes beyond market integration. At the same time, the Nobel Prize for the EU also illustrates well how contesting European futures has frequently conformed to basic principles of the Japanese martial art of jiu-jitsu. Central to this form of fighting is the concept of ju from a Chinese character commonly interpreted as gentle. Gentle only, however, in the sense of bending or yielding to an opponent's direction of attack but with the aim of controlling and then returning its force on the opponent. In our case of political contestation, to use pro-integration narratives on peace, democracy and welfare, as in the case of the uh, Norway's the Norwegian Co uh, Committee's award for the European Union, uh, and welfare ag gains against the European Union. So to turn the pro-integration narrative against the European Union. Thus Nigel Farage, who was working towards Brexit at that time, dismissed the Nobel Prize award, countering that the EU, by, I quote, taking away nation-state democracy, by attempting to impose a new flag and a new anthem, is very likely to cause a series of mini-civil wars, unquote. Similarly, Rassemblement National in France, the former Front National, places the European Union in a historical narrative of wars among European countries, I quote, often linked to tendencies to establish empires by subordinating and denying national realities, unquote. And Björn Höcke, the German far-right politician from the Alternative for Germany party, has demanded the dissolution of the European Union as a threat to German and European ethnic homogeneity that he defines as a precondition for peace and welfare. Exploring connections between Europhile and Eurosceptic actors and narratives and how they contest Europe's future or futures has several heuristic advantages. First, it allows us to overcome a simplistic understanding of Euroscepticism that is still latently there in some of the literature about Euroscepticism as degrees of nationalist rejection of Europe. In fact, the far right often actively supports alternative forms of what my colleague Richard McMahon has called Alt-Europe, a European civilization organized through intergovernmental cooperation and inspired by Christian conservatism and Islamophobia the kind of Europe, in other words, that, among others, Viktor Orban and Vladimir Putin also ostensibly, at least, advocate. Secondly, exploring such connections also makes it easier to understand how the dynamic interplay between Europhiles and Eurosceptics actively influences the positioning and arguments of far-right politics that contest the present-day EU. Daniele Pasquinucci, an Italian colleague, has demonstrated, for example, how Italian technocratic and political elites for a long time narrated EU membership as a welcome external constraint, welcome external constraint to strengthen fiscal prudence, facilitate economic reforms, and transform an inefficient Italian state. More recently, Italian Euro populists who emerged following the collapse of Christian democracy and the renaming of the neo fascist party in the 1990s have turned this story on its head, however. They now allege that Brussels is dictating terms to a subservient Italy that needs to be liberated from the control of an overbearing imperial center, Brussels. In my lecture, I will explore the dynamics between Europhiles and Eurosceptics in their contestation of Europe's future or futures in the past, in an attempt to provide a long-term perspective on Euroscepticism, right-wing politics, and the crisis of European democracy, to use the title of the summer school. I will do so in three steps, exploring one particular dimension of these dynamics in each of the three sections of my lecture. The first section will focus on the growth of the transnational politics of regulation in Europe since around the middle of the 19th century. I argue that this form of transnational politics was predominantly a pragmatic response to functional cross-border challenges of industrialization and proto-globalization, which deliberately depoliticized issues. This cooperation was designed to strengthen the individual and collective capabilities of states or nation states 
to address common problems, not to challenge a state-centric Europe. In the second section, I sketch how federalist in post-war Europe, post-Second World War Europe, pushed for a common European political überbau, to use Marxist terminology admittedly very loosely. They deliberately politicized functionally motivated cooperation to address cross-border challenges, chiefly through the creation of supranational institutions, a common legal system, and symbolic politics. These innovations were designed to turn states into member states of the newly created organizations which were predecessors of the present-day European Union and to tame them, not to get rid of them, but to tame them in the process. This challenge provoked and is continuing to provoke counter-mobilization around notions of national sovereignty and identity up to the point where a by now partly Americanized far right in Europe frequently chastises the European Union with anti-Semitic tropes as the European institutionalized form of globalism dominated by people from nowhere, to use the terminology of the former British Prime Minister Theresa May. Crucially, as I argue in the third section, Eurosceptics on the far right and the far left also do jujitsu with each other. While often portraying each other as mortal enemies reminiscent of the politics of extreme polarization in interwar Europe, both the far right and the far left reject the idea or possibility of transnational democracy, transnational democracy in a highly institutionalized form as in the European Union, although for different reasons. Instead, they often advocate varieties of what I suggest we should dub social nationalism. Let me come to the first section of my talk about technocratic internationalism and the nation state. The second half of the 19th century has sometimes been called a first phase of globalization, or a period of proto-globalization, which was also characterized by Europe's domination of global economic and political relations. Crucially, three of four factors that Mark Evans and Jonathan Davis have identified as driving cross-border cooperation and transfers from the 1960s onwards were already present then in the 19th century. They were, to begin with, technological progress, including the invention in those days of railways and the telegraph and much cheaper printing, with the necessity to create cross-border solutions for these new technologies. Secondly, economic expansion, interdependence and integration in the form of the second industrialization and European trade liberalization, starting with the British abolition of the Corn Laws. And thirdly, the growth of internationalist ideologies of economic liberalism and political socialism. Although Europe's global hegemony meant that the difference was often blurred in practice, these ideologies were internationalist, not European in their orientation. Crucially, they did not yet envisage ambitions, uh, ambitious forms sorry, of government beyond the nation state, globally or limited to Europe. Proto-globalization created new needs and opportunities for cross-border cooperation and transfers in this period. First, it increased trade and economic competition across borders. The impact of a set of bilateral trade treaties negotiated after 1860 persisted despite the selective imposition of higher tariffs in countries like France and Germany after 1879-1880. In these circumstances, national competitiveness was increasingly seen as depending on future-proof institutional arrangements, whether in company law or tariff policy or education, for example. The adoption of successful institutional arrangements in turn depended on efficient, if not necessarily representative, let alone democratic, political systems and administrations that were capable of learning from practices abroad. The second half of the 19th century was also a period of spreading rule of law and varieties of democratization. Political parties and governments had to address political demands increasingly articulated by vocal organized groups. To transfer institutional arrangements, it was more and more necessary to create domestic coalitions for change. 
in the case of the British National Insurance Act of 1911, to give you just one example, which partially imported German social insurance legislation, liberal politicians Lloyd George and Winston Churchill, yes, he was a liberal in those days, had to maximize domestic political support by legitimizing the proposed measures through several fact-finding missions to the German Reich. Growing competing nationalisms, frequently influenced by social Darwinist thinking, limited the scope for politically meaningful and institutionalized forms of transnational cooperation. The liberal democratic battle cry by the likes of Giuseppe Mazzini for a European revolution in 1848 turned out to be a largely meaningless rhetorical construct when nationalist demands for political organization and territorial integration often proved mutually exclusive. For the progressive political forces in the 19th century, Europe was never more than a loose notion. Transnational solidarity among political groups or social classes as a result was extremely limited and only articulated by outsiders when the First World War started in 1914. At the same time, for those on the political right, protecting a variety of old orders, Europe was little more than the natural, from their perspective, the natural civilizational center of the world and a space for competitive great power politics. Even in times of competing nationalisms, however, transnational cooperation became quite pervasive, but in the form of what Johann Schott and I, you've referred to the book that we published in 2014, have called technocratic internationalism. This was cooperation across borders focused on addressing functional technology-related issues which experts sought to wrest from the control of foreign ministries. These ministries, or so the technocratic internationalists believed, were dominated by thinking in terms of what political scientists would now call a zero-sum game. That is, forms of negotiation where one partner can only gain at the expense of the other. New technologies in transportation like railways and telecommunications like the telegraph and telephony in particular required common decisions, for example, on technical standards and infrastructures. Modern experts with scientific knowledge like engineers believed that through networking and deliberation, they would be able to identify po optimal policy solutions for these issues. For example, for the issue of the type and size of the gauge for a European railway system, to give you one example. Technocratic internationalists had a strong preference for informality, with only the final output of their cooperation, or cooperation such as a technical standard put down on paper in a form that all participants would then treat as binding. In our study, we found that their preference for informal cooperation equally shaped international organizations that were legally, strictly speaking, intergovernmental and based on an international treaty, like the Postal Union, for example, or voluntary transnational in nature and based on the informal cooperation of businesses and their representatives, like the steel cartels that emerged in the early 1890s. Moreover, the spatial scope of these organizations could be regional, European, or global, depending on the nature of the functional issue at stake. Crucially, technocratic internationalists never intended this form of functional cooperation to establish any form of political authority of a transnational European nature. A young Frenchman, Jean Monnet, sought to create such a political authority for the first time during the First World War in the form of the Allied Maritime Transport Council set up by the United Kingdom and France with the later participation of the United States and Italy. To allocate shipping tonnage, Allied shipping tonnage, more effectively to shorten the war. In this and similar associated organizations, Monet, Arthur Salter as the British representative and other leading officials aimed for a high degree of autonomy for themselves to overcome national government resistance against what they defined, they, the experts, defined as the overall collective interest of the Allies. Legally, however, their secretariat remained subordinate to an intergovernmental council of ministers. Moreover, Monet became disillusioned with continuous national government claims, counterclaims, and nationalist reporting uh, in newspapers, 
uh, and demands both in Britain and in France for the allocation of shipping tonnage to themselves. While the British government was afraid of a collapse of the home front, resulting in their uh, expectation from food sh shortages and socialist worker agitation, the French were more concerned about the resilience of their army on the front. Both sides made, made up numbers of shipping tonnage required and tried to pressurize the Secretariat to prepare decisions accordingly. When the war ended, Monet briefly lobbied the French government and the Versailles Peace Conference to adopt his institutional vision, not just for functional technical issues, but also for much more overtly politicized ones, like the redrawing of borders, as in the case of Upper Silesia and the future of Danzig or Gdansk. Building on the technocratic internationalism from before the First World War, Monet was keen to formalize the independence of experts from national governments, especially foreign ministries, and domestic political pressures to achieve outcomes that were, in the language that he adopted after the Second World War, I quote, in the interest of all Europeans. The peace conference completely ignored Monet's proposal, however. The victorious Western allies, and not just the far right, remained strongly attached to the notion of absolute national sovereignty and autonomy, which in their view required a formalized intergovernmental design for the future League of Nations. Its secretariat, with Monet as one of the deputy secretary generals until his resignation in 1923, remained entirely subordinated to the national foreign ministries. The League did engage in some old and some new forms of technocratic internationalism in areas like animal health, for example. Viruses were around in those days already. But without any independent political authority, as envisaged by Monet. Moreover, while dominated by European countries, it was, of course, a global, not a European organization. Thus, throughout the second half of the 19th century and the interwar period, the dominance of nationalism and national power politics, as well as the absence of any kind of institutional setup with claims to exercising political authority, independent political authority, guaranteed that the far right did not contest technocratic internationalist cooperation. Instead, they directed their fears about the future at domestic social groups, like Catholics and social democrats in Germany after uh, German unification and the formation of the German Reich. They also projected them onto imagined, allegedly or potentially powerful global actors like Jews or Asians in the form of the proliferating anti-Semitism and yellow danger discourses around the turn of the century. Let me now come to the second section, which is about the supranational challenge to the nation state after 1945. Although it had its origins in interwar Europe, the Federalist movement, as it formed after the Second World War, threw down the gauntlet to the nation states and their domination of Europe. Many leading politicians from the center left to the center right joined the associated organizations including prime ministers, foreign ministers, and party leaders, as well as transnational party organizations that had sprung up after the war. Many participated in the Congress of The Hague in May 1948 to deliberate the future of a more highly institutionalized form of Europe that would tame its future member states to prevent national conflicts and increase the welfare of its citizens. The Congress discussed ideas how to create an organized Europe that would be competent to exercise political authority. The debates included the question of the best institutional setup, the issue of economic integration through sector organizations or a horizontal customs union, and transnational initiatives in the field of education, for example, such as the creation of the College of Europe in Bruges in 1949-50. U.S. institutions like the Ford Foundation provided funds for cooperation and government lobbying. Students participated in activism such as protests at border posts that in their view symbolized the old Europe of nationalism and nation states that had been responsible for two world wars. Walter Lipkins and other activist historians promoted the notion of federalist forces having strongly influenced the process of supranational European integration, starting with the creation of the European Coal and Steel Community in 1951-52. Other accounts have challenged and revised this interpretation. They have highlighted, like Ellen S. Millward, 
the role of governments and their concrete interests and objectives in these negotiations. Or they have sought, uh, like I have done and others too, to bring the role of other partly transnational actors like political parties into the picture. In any case, while the European movement had strong influence over the actions of some governments, especially in Italy, where this is quite well documented, its role alone does not, of course, explain the nature and direction of European integration until the formation of the present-day European Union in the 1992 Maastricht Treaty and beyond. What does matter is that the Federalist agitation helped create the political überbau that had been missing from earlier forms of cooperation, including technocratic internationalism. Crucially, functionalists like Monet, who preferred governance, if you like, governance by experts as opposed to government by the people, had to ally themselves with this new agenda of the Federalists. His original Schumann plan did not foresee either a council of ministers or a parliament. Government negotiators added these institutional features during the negotiations leading up to the signing of the European Coal and Steel Community Treaty. Moreover, when they negotiated the European Economic Community Treaty during 1957-58, which strictly speaking is really the main legal predecessor of the European Union nowadays, they took from the 1954 European Political Community Draft Treaty, the first draft constitution, if you like, for Europe, the provision for a directly to be elected European Parliament, an innovation with potentially far-reaching effects despite the institution's initially very limited <laughs> control powers and the absence of budgetary or legislative powers, two core powers, of course, of any national parliaments and democracies. Over time, the present-day European Union has developed into a political system with many features of a federal state. They include the sole competence of the European Commission to initiate legislation, although the practice of initiating legislation also involves the Parliament and the member states as well, there from the beginning. They also comprise the direct election of the European Parliament since 1979 and its evolution into a co-legislator alongside the member states in the Council. In fact, the Parliament itself played a crucial role in driving this process of integration and transformation of the EU into a quasi-federal system forward. It did so especially by developing a strong narrative about the alleged democratic deficit not originally a far-right or far-left narrative, but the narrative of the unelected parliament already in the 1960s of the European community. A deficit from the perspective of the vast majority in the parliament logically to be addressed as at the national level by having the parliament directly elected and endowing it with full budgetary and legislative powers. The Parliament has regularly promoted this agenda through constitutional blueprints like the 1984 Draft Treaty on European Union and most recently the Conference on the Future of Europe which was concluded last year. And of course, we may add with quite some success over time because it ha now does have this powerful role of being co-legislator for most policy issues together with the Council or the Member States in the Council. The creation and subsequent evolution of this political überbau in the form of a highly institutionalized political system with more and more federal features was accompanied by the active shaping of a supranational legal system that bolstered and protected it. As Antoine Vaucher, Morten Rasmussen and others have demonstrated, outstanding lawyer politicians formed a growing network in the newly established field of European law, starting from the late 1950s, early 1960s onwards. The field of European law just didn't exist. You had international law or national law, and somehow this intermediate level had to be developed, and lawyers had to be drawn into this new evolving field following the creation of the ECSE and the EEC in order to support the eventual supranational interpretation of the EEC treaty by the European Court of Justice. So with the help of the European Commission's legal service, this network buttressed the purposefully supranational interpretation by the Court of Justice, starting with the first two decisions in 1963-64 about the supranationality and direct effect of EEC law. 
National German and French courts occasionally contested its interpretation, as in the famous 1974 so lange German decision of the German Constitutional Court. But they were unable to stop the evolution of a supranational legal as well as institutional system. Lastly, federalist pressures also contributed to the evolution of EU symbolic politics, including the widespread use of the flag and the anthem, as well as the later introduction of the EU passport, for example, going back to initiatives of the European Parliament and its 1985 Adonino report for a Europe of citizens, as it was called. At a time when the European community still did not have significant powers in core fields of national sovereignty, like monetary or foreign and defense policy, its de facto, not de jure, limitation of nation-state symbolism, nevertheless, imitation, sorry, of nation-state symbolism, symbolism, nevertheless signaled its ambition to foster the allegiance of its citizens in a multi-level Europe of shared sovereignty and multi-layered identities. The formation of a quasi-federal EU has taken place over a period of 70 years with its ups and downs and with the F word, as it's called in Brussels, and that doesn't refer to the British reference to the F word, but to federal, the F word, hardly pronounced in Brussels these days. This incremental transformation is also the main reason why the far-right defenders of the notion of absolute national sovereignty and exclusive national identity in a strictly intergovernmental Europe found it very hard for a long time to challenge the European Union. It was simply supremely difficult to draw a red line where institutionalized cooperation went just too far and could fatally undermine nation-state sovereignty. In the beginning, moreover, organized far-right politics outside of pro-integration political parties was marginal in domestic politics. Gaullism in France had a more mixed political agenda and voter base. It was also an outlier among the six EEC founding member states for a long time. French President de Gaulle's rhetorical crusade against what Farage later called the unelected Brussels bureaucrats was heavily conditioned by his strong interest in European cooperation and common economic policies like the customs union and especially the common agricultural policy. His stand in the 1965 empty chair crisis caused him problems with voters in the presidential elections later in the same year and induced him to conclude the informal Luxembourg compromise about a continued veto in inverted commas of member states in the case of uh, national supreme national interest in January 1966. Similarly, the Conservative Party in England, which now does appear in large measure a highly radicalized nationalist far-right political party, still saw major benefits in community membership in the 1980s and 1990s. It actually supported giving greater powers to the supranational institutions to achieve particular policy objectives, especially the creation of the internal market. The British government insisted on majority voting for the internal market, something that Farage failed to mention in the Brexit campaign. This in turn became linked to more majority voting and some legislative powers for the European Parliament as well. At the same time, far-right politics in the community for a long time was characterized by three other important traits. The first was that it was staunchly anti-communist during the Cold War period and saw some form of organized Western Europe as an extension of NATO and insurance policy against the Soviet Union. Secondly, it held for a long time that it could politically capture this organized Europe in defense of what it regarded as an ethnically homogeneous white Europe that would shield the member states against migrants from outside of Europe. So in favor of cooperation in order to keep migrants out. Thirdly, it actually advocated European economic liberalization. That's also very important to keep in mind when you look at the far right uh, populist policies and policy preferences and rhetoric nowadays. It advocated European economic liberalization as a means to overcome what it argued were overly generous and unaffordable national welfare policies in countries like Italy and France. These were also the three main reasons why the Italian neo-fascist and the French Front National were in this sense in the 70s and 80s conditionally pro-European 
roughly until the end of the Cold War. In historical perspective, therefore, we can see that far-right politics is not by nature anti-European. Rather, its contemporary Europe populist incarnation has developed since the 1990s as a result of the collapse of communism as an ideological, political and foreign policy challenge. Because the EU initially did not erect, from their perspective, secure enough fences, political or material fences, against migrants from outside of Europe, and because large parts of the socialist left discovered the EU as a site for safeguarding some form of European or Europeanized welfare state with increased transnational fiscal transfers to poorer member states, something that Euro populists on the right, especially in Northern Europe, have strongly resented. Lastly, the EU, for good reasons, has expanded far since the 1990s into policy fields that had been considered for a long time as national prerogatives. Monetary policy, home affairs, border control, uh, and increasingly also foreign and defense policy. For far-right politics, this made the previously more latent threat of the EU's further integration to national sovereignty and identity much more tangible and also easier to exploit for electoral purposes in times of what many voters experience as socio-economic upheaval and repetitive crises. In these circumstances, democratic backsliding and new forms of authoritarian politics, especially in, but not limited to, Eastern Europe, appear to have re-legitimized re notions of strong rule by charismatic leaders, which has, of course, always been a key characteristic of modern right-wing politics since the late 19th century. Let me come to the third section now, where I would like to talk more briefly about jiu-jitsu between the left and the right. European integration has been an incremental process driven by federalist ambitions for transnational democracy, with supranational institutions and perceived and real functionalist needs or functional needs for cross-border cooperation and more effective decision-making beyond the state. To paraphrase the British Labour Eurosceptic Barbara Castle's quip about Britain and Europe, despite the occasional controversial national referendum, we have bought ourselves all the way into the quasi-federal contemporary European Union. Unlike previous revolutions, moreover, European integration from the outset was driven by moderate political forces from the center-left to the center-right. Institutionally, they have advocated and practiced moderation, compromise, and consensus in the quest for effective transnational politics and policymaking within supranational institutions. This broad centrist alliance was often a matter of choice in the European Parliament and is now a matter of electoral arithmetic. It's necessary for these centrist parties or center-left to center-right parties to work together to be able to form majorities in the Parliament and to have an impact on the legislative process. Politically, these forces have worked towards a kind of third way. As Laurent Valoset has demonst demonstrated, their Europe was never one of neoliberal extremes, whatever some on the far left may have alleged or imagined. Rather, it has combined different socio-economic traditions and preferences in a managed adaptation to global economic and political pressures. Consequently, both the far left and the far right have attacked the EU since the end of the Cold War. Exploring the jiu-jitsu between left and right-wing politics over Europe as a result appears crucially important for developing a better understanding of the Europopulist challenge as the core focus of this conference, or summer school. One important reason for the conditional support of far-right politics for European integration during the Cold War was precisely the opposition of the far-left to it and its affiliation with the Soviet Union, as in France and Greece, for example, as well as in Italy until the evolution of Eurocommunism in the 1960s. After all, the far left opposed European integration as a sinister American attempt at expanding capitalism and preventing the communist transformation of Western European nation states. When the new left forces emerged from the social movements of the 1960s and 1970s, they were also initially highly critical of the community. 
They were more concerned about the environmental impact of capitalist production, however, and often saw the nation state as the main culprit, not a source of hope for societal transformation. Like the West German Greens in the run-up to the 1989 European elections, they advocated the transformation of the community into what the German Greens called at the time a Europe of eco-regions, a vision of a highly decentralized form of governance that in its origins was bordering on anarchistic visions of Europe. The institutional vision of a Europe of eco-regions was only very weakly embedded in Green Party ideolo ideology, however, and never articulated very coherently. Ultimately, it turned out that the new left was more concerned with its policy, policy objectives, such as better solutions for transnational issues like environmental degradation. This preference eventually proved reconcilable with the mixed federalist functionalist paradigm in the EU, and was perhaps most clearly articulated by the German Green Party Foreign Minister Joschka Fischer in his speech at the Humboldt University in the year 2000. Euro-communist and new left parties making up to the EU, reconciling themselves to the European Union, helped transform it into a suitable target for the Europopulist right in post-Cold War Europe. Progressive political forces, loosely defined, seemed intent on hollowing out the nation-state from below as well as from above, effectively making common cause with regional nationalisms, as in Catalonia or Scotland, for example. The Europopulist right now began to see and present the EU as a framework for open borders, uncontrolled immigration, and the dilution in their view of Europe's ethnic homogeneity. Lastly, the Europopulist right moved to distance itself from its older preferences for European market integration as a means of combating an allegedly inefficient and overbearing national welfare state. Instead, as in Italian narratives, the Europopulist right now alleges that the EU's social economic policies are geared towards protecting the interests of transnational pro-globalization elites at the expense of their nationals who are portrayed as the victims of EU-level <laughs> liberalization policies of fiscal transfers, depending on whether you're in the north or the south. This last shift towards what I would call a form of social nationalism rejects notions of transnational solidarity outright and demands the repatriation of powers and policies to protect the welfare of national citizens. It is at this point that the Europopulist right meets those sections of the far left who have failed to reconcile themselves with the idea of the EU as a transnational democracy with a quasi-federal political system. This realignment is most clearly visible in France since the 1992 Maastricht Treaty referendum. In their self-declared quest for protecting the French against an overbearing EU, both Marine Le Pen and Jean-Luc Mélenchon converge on social nationalist demands and deviate mainly in terms of their attitudes to migrants. The de facto rapprochement in Germany, which I think we are seeing ha is happening now, beginning to happen now, between the likes of Sarah Wagenknecht and Björn Höcke on social economic policy matters, to give just one other example as I'm speaking here in Germany, seems to mimic these patterns of ideological and electoral alignment and competition. In this scenario, pro-integration elites advocate transnational democracy with supranational institutions as the desirable or only realistic format for cooperation in Europe in the light of functional policy challenges and foreign policy threats like Putin's Russia. Europopulist elites oppose this Europe in the name of the people who allegedly require their protection with social nationalist policies at the nation-state level. Already in interwar Europe did the far left and far right thrive on this kind of polarization. This time, however, their similarly uneasy alliance opposes the idea and practice of transnational democracy as opposed to the attack on national democracy in interwar Europe. To conclude, uh, in my lecture I've tried to sketch, and I understand very broadly, sketch uh, the evolution of connections between Europhile and Eurosceptic mobilization and narratives over time. The 19th century and interwar Europe largely saw functional forms of European cooperation intend to depoliticize transnational issues and to strengthen the capacity of the modern state or nation state to address them. 
These issues mostly derived from technological innovations in transport and telecommunications. Crucially, the formal intergovernmental or informal voluntary business-dominated forms of cooperation similarly lacked any ambition to exercise political authority. As a result, the far right did not oppose such forms of cooperation. After the Second World War, however, Federalist mobilization formed an uneasy alliance with neo-functionalists like Monet and their preferred governance practices. Federalists were for government by the people in a supranational Europe with a directly elected parliament and functionalists for governance by experts bypassing member states, in particular foreign ministries, as allegedly obsessed with securing national gains at the expense of others. The resulting incremental evolution of a quasi-federal EU has involved the creation of supranational institutions, an integrated legal system and forms of symbolic politics that all undergird its strong ambition to exercise political authority, not against, but beyond the nation state. While the far right conditionally supported Western European integration under the conditions of the Cold War, it has progressively become more Euro populist since the 1990s in the ways that I've tried to outline. Moreover, I have suggested that we need to explore in historical perspective not just the jujitsu between Europhiles and Euroskeptics, but also between the far left and the far right to better understand their new alignment around what I've called social nationalism. While their identity politics differs, their Socioeconomic preferences and narratives easily align and fundamentally call into question the idea of a transnational democracy with supranational institutions, politics, and policy making. At this point and in conclusion, I would like to recall the formation of two other transnational democracies with supranational, in inverted commas, or federal institutions in the 19th century, namely Switzerland and the United States. Both states saw interstate and transnational conflicts, depending on the perspective, over the allocation of powers and resources. In the case of Switzerland, these conflicts align predominantly with ideational confessional differences and effects of industrialization and urbanization. In the United States, it was primarily the policy issues of trade and slavery. In both cases, domestic polarization grew over time up to a point which is somewhat similar, I would say, to the European Union in 2023. This polarization led to the destructive civil wars in 1847-48 and 1861-65, respectively. The outcome of both wars confirmed a more federal institutional setup and progressive policy agendas than before, although the underlying differences in social cultural attitudes persisted for a long time and to some extent, of course, until today. Neither the Catholic Swiss cantons nor the Confederate states were able to negotiate opt-outs or a secession clause. The EU has used opt-outs since the 1970s to keep member states inside the EU and to facilitate further integration. In the Lisbon Treaty, on the initiative of the British Labour government, the EU also integrated the leave option to avoid extreme polarization and much more dramatic interstate or civic conflict, let alone civil war, as imagined by Farage, whom I quoted at the start of my lecture. The EU, I would therefore say, has thus put its primary original motivation to create and maintain peace among its member states over and above questions of efficient government or transnational democracy, in this sense. Arguably, the United Kingdom's use of the secession clause following the 2016 referendum has actually strengthened the internal unity of and support for the EU of the remaining and among the remaining 27 member states and their population. This is a union, moreover, that despite its many weaknesses has actually shown great and for many, I think, surprising resilience in the face of domestic polarization, democratic backsliding, the COVID-19 crisis and growing external threats from brutal dictatorship like Putin's Russia and Xi Jinping's China. Thank you.